Hey everybody, Chris Collard. I am at the uh, Overland Expo Pacific Northwest, and to my left here is Dan Greck, a good friend of mine and one of the most coolest, is that a word, coolest? I don't know. Adventure dudes, I know, Dan. Like, tell everybody about what you do. Well, Chris, uh, I've spent the last 10 years or so driving around the world um, in Jeeps and, and documenting my adventures as I go, showing people what's possible when, when you go out and have a life of adventure. Tell us about how you got here. It's like, what, what happened 10 years ago that made you decide to like, you know, take off in a Jeep? I used to be an engineer, Chris. Um, I was sitting at a desk every day of my life and it kind of scared me actually into action because I realized if, if nothing changed, I would still be sitting at that same desk in 40 years you know, and, and nothing really exciting would happen in the meantime. And so that, that scared me enough to say like, I'm gonna quit my job, I'm gonna sell all of my stuff and I'm just gonna go for it. Um, and I ended up driving, I went up to Alaska because I'd always dreamed of Alaska. And then I turned around and I drove all the way to Argentina. Right. So the whole, all of Central and South America, I spent two years exploring, like I poked lava with a stick, I climbed a 20,000 foot volcano, met all kinds of interesting people. It like gave me a whole different kind of perspective on life and what are my priorities? Do I want to just go to work every day and earn money and maybe like buy a new car and a big house? Or do I want to go out and have experiences and, and learn about the world? And the decision was the correct one? <laughs> uh, I mean, it depends what you're looking for. I, I certainly don't have a new iPhone and you know, I don't, I don't have much money anymore, but I've had some incredible experiences and, and met wonderful people along the way. So you got an accent. You were living in Canada, was that right? That's and right. Working as an engineer? Yep. Like, yeah, but from? I grew up in Australia, uh, finished university there and then came out to Canada to go snowboarding basically and, and I fell in love with Canada and snowboarding and then I ran out of money so I had to get a real job. <laughs> <laughs> you ran out of the story of everybody's life, right? Pretty much. So, um, and then, but you started, when we met, you were starting to write about it. That's right, yeah. I, so I was over, the editor of Overland Journal, guys, uh, from, you know, for seven years. And it must have been around 2012 or 13 that we met. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and I, I was like, I heard your story, heard Dan's story, and I'm like, dude, this is some cool stuff. You need to like send me some stories, right? We'll publish them. And and during the Americas trip, I started really daydreaming about if, if I want to do this for the rest of my life, how am I going to make it sustainable? How can I help make an income, but also get enjoyment while I'm on the road? And so documenting it sort of became my passion. And I was blogging at the time and like posting lots of photos as much as anything just to practice because I needed to practice writing and I needed to practice my photography. All right. Yeah. So what were you driving in, in the America's trip? I drove a little two-door TJ Wrangler. Um, it had a soft top and absolutely no modifications at all. So I, I didn't have a fridge. I didn't have a winch. I didn't have a roof rack. I didn't have solar panels. Uh, I had like a small ground tent, a box of food and a bag of clothes and that is all that I had with me. So you grabbed your sleeping bag and whatever you had in the garage, was like, okay, we're going to Ushuaia. I did a little more planning than that. I had a good assortment of spare parts and tools and, and I'd, I'd researched most of the visas and I was fairly confident that I could do it, but, but I actually didn't know. I'd, I'd never heard of anyone else doing it. Um, I didn't even know what the word overlanding was. I'd never heard of it. And in fact, I, I didn't even bump into anyone else on the road until I was in, I think, Guatemala. I met some Aussies who'd just driven up from South America. And I was like, you can really do it? And they were like, yeah, go for it, it's great. So how, many, how long did that take you? And that, how many countries did you go through? Yeah, the Americas trip ended up taking two years. Because I was having such a good time, I just slowed down. And when you don't drive, you don't use gas, which is the biggest expense. So you can get by on $5 a day if you're not going anywhere. Um, so yeah, in two years I traveled through 17 countries. There's a lot of places down there where it's really inexpensive to buy, uh, say, street food or buy street food in the market. Sometimes it was basically all the food I can carry for just a couple of dollars. Yeah. 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 Really cheap. So 17 countries, uh, two years, how many miles? Uh, that was 40,000 miles. And the, the little Jeep was fantastic. It never broke down once. It took me everywhere I've ever dreamed of going, like the salt flats of Bolivia and, and all those kind of wild places. So we met. You had, you didn't have that vehicle anymore. That's right. Why? <laughs> when I got to the end of the road in uh, Argentina in Ushuaia, basically I was out of money and shipping it back probably would have cost more than it was worth. And so I just made the really hard decision and, and I actually sold it in Argentina. Was that difficult um, to do? It was hard to do, but also it felt like the right thing to do because I needed to do something different with my life. I'd kind of, I'd been living in that little car for two years and I was, I wasn't sick of it, but it, it was time for something else. 
Um, and the incredible thing was I bought it for $5,000 before the trip in Canada. I drove it those 40,000 miles and then I sold it for $5,000 in Argentina. So the, the Jeep never broke down and it was free. Wow. Yeah. It's not bad depreciation. <laughs> I was really like, I don't think there is a better vehicle that can do that. It was amazing. So when we met, when we met, you were prepping your vehicle. You were just actually about ready to leave for, for Africa. That's right. And the new vehicle was a JK? That's right, a four-door JK Rubicon. Um, and, and I really wanted to improve three major things. I wanted to improve my sleeping setup. So I had a pop-up Ursa Minor roof on that Jeep. I wanted to improve my cooking and my food. Um, and so I had a fridge this time, a little mini kitchen, some pots and pans and, and cutlery. Um, and I wanted to improve where I can hang out when the weather's really bad or when the mosquitoes are bad. And so I did, I had like a little bit of interior living space in that vehicle. I could hang out inside of it when it was pouring rain. So you took the lessons that you learned from your first two years on the road and you're like, okay, this is what I need for the next one. Cause you went to Africa for how long? <laughs> uh, it took three years in the end to drive the entire coastline of Africa. I went through 35 different countries. Uh, it was 54,000 miles. So I'm gonna take a segue here. Dan's learned a lot of stuff and he's awesome at sharing it. So I've been following you on YouTube, um, which is The Road Chose Me. That's right. So go on YouTube, find The Road Chose Me, subscribe because you've got just a ton, years of experience um, on your videos of just everything you've been doing. So back to Africa. I mean, that's <laughs> 35 countries, right? That's yeah. right. That's, that's phenomenal. And, but when you were doing that, yeah, I mean, I told you, it's like, man, you gotta start sending me some stuff, but you went through the Congo, the DRC, I mean, all over the whole West that's Africa. That's right, Nigeria, yeah, Cameroon, yeah. Gabon, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, all, all of it. Probably had like thousands of memorable experiences, but tell us just about what you learned going through some of the parts which we used to be called dark Africa. It's not really politically correct anymore, but it's places that nobody goes, especially, uh, you know, a white Australian guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I knew that I would get remote and I knew I'd get off the beaten path, but it, it turned out to be like a thousand times more than I thought. Um, and so the main road from Cameroon into Nigeria uh, is really famous. It's been really horrific for years, like mud and jungle and but they actually had just finished paving it before I got there. And so it's kind of a boring road now. And so instead I went up into the mountains, a route that I don't really think overlanders have ever taken before. And I found this old smugglers track and kind of bumped along that and bumped into guys who were smuggling gasoline back and forward. And they were really friendly and drove down across the border. Actually, it was just a river. My GPS said it was the border, but there was no immigration. There was no customs, nothing. So now I'm in the next country, sleep at night, just in a little village with friendly people keep driving, have to sort of take a detour to this immigration post. And when I walked up to the immigration guy, he did a huge double take and he said to me, how did you even get here? And I kind of explained the story and he was like, I've been working here for four years and I've never seen a foreigner in my whole life. So even, even like, you know, I drove my Jeep to a place in Africa where foreigners had never been before in, in that was 2018. It's incredible that you can still do that. I was, you know, blown away by that. Yeah. So we, we were on a panel together talking yesterday talking about travel, it's security, that type of thing. And you said a few things that really stuck with me because they're things that I've learned in, in traveling and that's about the people. So everybody, you know, we, we said, oh, we're going to Mexico, we're going to, um, you know, Africa, any country in Africa. People get a little nervous. Definitely. What did you learn? I think the media has really done a disservice to, to a lot of countries in the world and especially African countries because they just show us the bad stuff. And, and even to this day, if you say the word Rwanda, everyone thinks genocide, everyone thinks it's horrible. The genocide was 29 years ago. It's like, what has Rwanda been doing for 29 years? Turns out they've been developing, there's high rise buildings, they have a huge tech sector, they're developing iPhone apps. It is immensely clean, friendly, safe, happy place to be. And so Rwanda still has this bad reputation and it's just not deserved at all. And I, I saw that play out time and again in Africa where I would even show up places and feel a bit nervous and I'm like, oh, I, I don't know if this is safe or not. And someone would come over to me and say, hello, my friend, you are welcome. Come, come camp in my village, welcome. This, this is my family. You can have here, here's some food, here's some water. For no reason. It's incredible. They, they didn't want money. They, they just, you know, and I'm a strange looking guy in a, in a big vehicle. Like, I, they didn't know if I was there to hurt them. Okay. Yeah, but, right. but they were friendly to me just because they're friendly people. And there were quite a few times actually it brought tears to my eyes and I, you know, because you're alone and you're tired and, and you're vulnerable and people just look after you and they treat you really, really well. It's humbling. Very humbling. dealing with people that have close to nothing. 
literally living in mud huts or even uh, palm frond huts and they're offering me food and me drinking water. And I, and yeah. Tea and, yeah, I was blown away time and again. We're good? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah, no another beautiful day in Nigeria. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, welcome to Nigeria. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a good day. Good journey. Thank you. Yeah. And, I, and I say now, like, you know, elephants are amazing and I'm really happy I got to see all the lions and the giraffes and like, but if I went back to Africa right now, I wouldn't be upset if I didn't see any of that. I would just get in a vehicle and drive into the middle of nowhere and, and try and hang out in like a remote village and just and just sit with people and just listen to their stories and like hang out with them, whether like we go for a walk or whatever it is. That's actually why I want to go back to Africa. So how did the Jeep do? You put uh, a new top on it? That's right, right the pop-up roof. Yep, and that was uh, Ursa Minor? Ursa Minor, yeah. yep. Yeah, and that was fantastic. I slept in it virtually every night for three years. Um, and it still works today as well as the day I bought it. So that was amazing. Um, AEV suspension, AEV bumpers, a worn winch, and all of that was flawless. I had a drinking water tank and filtration set up, which was really essential in Africa. Um, and then some creature comforts like a, a Dometic fridge, some Renergy solar panels, and all of those just helped me be you know, sufficient even when I was out in the middle of nowhere. It's different when you're going for a weekend or a week versus you're living in your vehicle for three years. It, it really was my house. I remember one of your um, excerpt from one of his uh, articles that he wrote um, that you you were talking about everything has been wet. Everything is damp, wet, mildew in my cabinets and it's just because yep. of the humidity and the rain and the water, yeah. Yeah, I remember that was in Guinea and I found mold on a couple of my shirts and that was when I stopped having fun that week. I was like, I don't want this anymore. We've been wearing the same shirts for several days. They're not starting to mold. Though. Not yet. They smell. Yeah. <laughs> so how did that trip wrap up? Uh, the plan all along actually was to drive the entire loop. So I, was, I got to the pyramids in Egypt and that was like a huge emotional kind of thing for me. It had been three whole years of my life. And I really wanted to drive out of Africa and drive into Israel. But that's a tricky part of the world, the Sinai Peninsula, it has a lot of rebels and it's dangerous. And so Egypt actually wouldn't let me do it. They said it was too dangerous. Um, so I shipped the Jeep from Africa, from uh, Egypt, all the way back to Canada. And then I just flew back and, and that was the end of the trip. Wow. Yeah. yeah and but the, your adventure was not over. No, it didn't. Like, I know you started like re-prepping for the land down under, the, the homeland, motherland. That's right. Pretty much <laughs> if I'm not on an adventure, I'm trying to save money for whatever adventure comes next. Um, and then COVID happened and we all kind of got stuck places. Um, but my Australian passport meant that I could fly into Australia. And I had never explored Australia and I hadn't spent time with my family in many, many years. And so a big, a big perfect storm came together of like, I really want to explore my home country. Yeah, I want to go and see all the wild stuff that I've heard about, but I'd never been able to see before. For some reason, I think we talked when we first met and um, you're like, you know what, Chris, you've seen more of my country than I have. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd really only seen like one little corner of yeah. Australia. And so there was a ton of states I'd never been to, like really iconic destinations. And it was, it felt like the right thing to do, to go so you, and explore. Did you also go across the center? Is I did. Right? Yeah, you did. Canning Stock and... Canning Stock route and across the Simpson yeah. Desert on the Madigan line. You did the whole Cape York, across the Darwin, the Kimberleys, That's down right. south. That's right. Fraser Star Island, Tasmania, Bay, Victorian Perth, High Country, everything. everything. Yeah. yeah, everything. <laughs> Yeah, and it was, it, you know, it felt kind of fulfilling to be like, I've, I've seen so much of my country now and I know what it's like. So you were driving a new vehicle at that time. That's right. right. Yeah, I flew to Australia and I bought a Jeep Gladiator, which was a controversial choice in Australia. They don't have a great reputation there. People don't really think Jeeps are up to Australian conditions. And because of my past experience, I thought, what happens if I show them? Like, I knew deep down that a Jeep would be perfectly good. You know, it. it traveled Africa without a single problem, it, it'll be fine in Australia. Um, and so that's what I did. And I kind of enjoyed showing people what the Jeep could actually do. They, they were quite astounded actually many times. Sometimes I almost forget that I'm Australian, but there'd be times where like I'd walk into a pub and someone would be like, g'day mate, do you want a beer? And I'd be like, yeah, like that sounds really good. Or like a, a meat a pie or, or stubby or yeah, like, yeah, like isky in the bag. <laughs> all of those things that like I'd forgotten about. And I'm like, that's like deep down part of me. And like, I'm like, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> so it was, cool. yeah, I enjoyed it immensely to, to really spend time with Australians because I, I don't get to do that much anymore. How long were you there? Uh, I was in Australia a year and a half. Right. Yeah. You, so I looked at the map. You were like 50,000 miles or something? Uh, 36,000 miles. 36,000 miles. Yeah, in just one country. Like that's how big Australia is. It's huge. Yeah. Okay, if you go to Australia, don't think that you're going to go like, yeah, go to um, 
see the whole country, like let's do Australia in a week, no way. You won't no. see anything. No, 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 no. Yeah. A month, I'd place. say minimum yeah. is a month, but yeah. really six months if you want to see some good stuff. And now you're back in the States. Back in the States. And there's a new rig behind us. That's right. And like, and you got, he's got a booth set here, you're selling books, <laughs> which you get on your website. Right? That's right, and, and Amazon as well, you can buy my books. Right, um, which is theroadchoseme.com. That's right. And so now we're back and we've got this cool Rubicon. Tell us about this. The dream all along. Stop and just look at this map on the back too. <laughs> <laughs> From all of my travels, Chris, I've learned, you know, interior living space becomes the most important thing on a long trip. I love being outside. I love cooking outside and, you know, reading a book when the weather's nice, when there aren't horrible mosquitoes. But there's that one day a week where you really want to get your mental sanity back and to be able to be out of the sun, out of the dust, out of the mosquitoes, that's what I crave and that's what I'm looking for in my new vehicle. Mm -hmm. So we've built, this is a 2021 Wrangler Eco Diesel Rubicon and basically we cut it off behind the front doors and grafted on a carbon fiber composite living box. Um, and so this box, it's really hard to imagine. You can put two Jeep Gladiator beds inside of it side by side and still have room to spare. So the floor plan on this is huge, even though it's just a Wrangler. It's, it keeps messing with my brain You're every time I... Right. I mean, it's going to have running hot water. I'm going to have a diesel heater. I'm going to have a hot shower. I'm like, I'm stepping into like the 18th century. It's going to be amazing. Wow, awesome. <laughs> so um, who built the box? So this guy, his name is Michael Fuchs. Um, and on Instagram, he's Wabi Sabi Overland. He is kind of a genius working with composites and fabrication and also all the engineering design work. What we've done right now is he's built two of them, one for me, one for himself and we're basically just going to use them and test them and see how they go. They're prototypes, evaluate them. Are they tough enough? Is it a big enough living space? You know, is it worth making more of them? Does it really work? Right. Well, you talked about space. How about weight? So amazingly, and of course, being a Wrangler, weight is the number one you know, question or thing to think about. We cut off about 750 pounds of sheet metal and glass and rear doors and interior stuff. What we replaced it with weighs less than that. So, Wow. So we massively increased the livability and we actually made the vehicle lighter. Dry weight, yeah. it has a higher payload. What are you using for an energy system? Uh, I will, I haven't actually designed it completely, but uh, Renergy Solar, they have a brand new system called their Rego, which is kind of like plug and play, all the different components. There'll be a whole slew of solar panels on the roof, some lithium batteries, yeah. And then water tanks as well, for sure, um, a diesel heater, and some sort of hot water that I haven't designed yet. It's gonna be luxury <laughs> for sure. Um, and I am planning on insulating the canvas because it will pop up the roof, which means I plan on taking it to colder places. I was going to say, it's like you've done a huge amount of travel in Africa, a huge amount of travel in the Americas and you, in Australia. That's right. Like, so this is going to be like your Arctic rig. Exactly colder right. I think places. when I look at the world map, I mean, I'm going to spend time north of the equator yeah. and probably a long way north of the equator. I see a lot of it, it space out here across Asia and and Russia, and India, you know, the subcontinent that don't have lines on them yet. That's that's what I dream about at night. Yeah, the, the parts of the map that don't have lines on them, that, that's where I'm going next. Fill in the lines. That's right. So we're gonna get a couple books because I've read a lot of your stuff, but it's like there's a lot, I'm sure that there's a lot of those little intricate details of those, you know, the emotional side. Because I know that you're a good writer and shares like the things that you were thinking when you're cooped up in you're, you know, in your JK in the middle of Ghana or Uganda or where was it that was, your shirts were molding. It's like <laughs> the things that you think about and write about, those are like, those are the experiences that often you don't hear about um, in detail because they come from heart. You might not get that in an article that you wrote for Overland Journal or, or Tread Magazine. Or That's right. And, and I try to keep it really honest as well and just be brutal and be like, there are days where I'm just exhausted and like lonely um, and then I rolled my Jeep in Uganda and like I was just shattered. I, I would have cried if I hadn't been so exhausted. I just crumpled onto the ground and didn't know what to do. So all of that, like I, I put into the books because I really want to show people what it's, what it's genuinely like to go and do this kind of thing. Yeah. Not for yeah. the faint of heart. Oh. <laughs> Some people call me brave and I always say there's a fine line between brave and crazy. That's stupid, and like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, <laughs> sometimes I'm not sure which side of the line I'm on. But, you know, I think just going for it and having adventure has become like what m makes me happy and what, you know, makes me passionate about getting out there. And so I want to keep doing that. So based on that comment, is there anything you'd like to tell our viewers that, you know, about the daydreams that they have, you know, aspirations? Yeah, for sure. I, I've said for a long time now that dreams are meant to be lived. 
And I think whether that is getting out on a weekend or if you've always dreamed of getting to Alaska, like start talking to your boss so you can get a few months off. And, and even if it takes years to organize, trust me when I say it will be worth it. You will remember your Alaska trip for the rest of your life. So find a way to make it happen. Yeah, it's hard work. Saving money is difficult. There's gonna be a lot of obstacles along the way and you will remember it forever. It will be worth it. Anything else you wanna add before we call No, I think that's it. Uh, Thanks, thanks very much. It's so good to see you again. And uh, I'm sure we'll catch up again soon somewhere around the world. I think we're on a couple of panels this afternoon. Yeah, today. And <laughs> today. <laughs> soon enough. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for joining us. Dan Greck, The Road Shows Me. Don't forget to find them on uh, YouTube on that same channel, The Road Shows Me, or find them on uh, theroadshowsme.com and uh, pick up some of Dan's books and swag and just awesome talking to you. <laughs> thanks, Chris. Yeah. Real pleasure. All right. See you guys.